man, you know, every year, and this is kind of what I, I really try in the channel, I want to give you good advice. Um, there's people that say, well, why don't you use this or why don't you do this? It's because I don't believe in it. And if I don't believe in it, I'm not going to, it doesn't matter. I have offers, I'm not even going to name products or certainly manufacturers, anything like that. I never want to cut down a specific manufacturer, but there's products out there that people have offered to pay me um, and sponsor me. And I have quite a few paid partnerships and, um, and they're hard to come by. Um, I like to keep them long term. I value them greatly. I don't want to promote things I do not believe in no matter how much money that they give me. And, uh, and that's very important about this channel, which sets it apart from a lot of other channels, people using products just to get paid, switching products, manufacturers, just to get a bigger check. That's not me. And so when it comes to bad hunting advice, ways that you can waste a lot of dollars, I, you know, especially those wasting dollars, wasting time, um, just critical. You know, we, we had a time waster video recently and, you know, the fact that you can shoot more deer or have a better hunt you, know, you can't shoot them sitting on the couch. Well, that's garbage. That's hurt so many different hunters. You know, there's times where you just, more times, time in the woods helps. Most of the time, quality trumps quantity any time of the day. And that's bad advice throughout the decades. People say you can't shoot deer sitting on the couch. And that's, in a short words, it's BS when you look at it that way. And it's unfortunate that people have believed in that. How to waste your money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over that. I covered up some of these right here because I'm going to leave those to the end. And just real quickly, I want to go through things that are quality investments of your hunting dollars that you should be focusing on. Number one, quality clothing. Cheap clothing lasts a few years, maybe even a decade. Quality clothing, clothing lasts for decades. And it's not only that it lasts for decades, it has the best materials that make you comfortable for decades. So when you figure out the dollars you're spending for years and the dollars you're spending for sit, you're talking dollars per sit, cents per sit. It lasts for a very long time. And you know what's cool about high quality clothing? You can pass it down to your kids, your grandkids, your niece, your nephew, whoever it might be, years down the road, decades down the road, when you feel like you want to change clothing. Really cool. And so that's the difference in quality clothing. It's something that is an investment, and it is an investment um, into your future and in the, in the comfort of your, your hunt. Number two, quality tree stands. We use family tradition tree stands. There's USA Steel, made in America, Charlotte, Michigan. You know, that is awesome. Uh, Jack Turner um, and his crew, they make these stands, and they're extremely high quality. They're meant to last. Jack believes in his stands and wants to control the quality of them so much that he actually pre-assembles them. So when you pull a stand out of the box, it's hefty, it's built, it's rubber-coated chain, it's steel, and it's strong, and it's put together already so you don't have to spend two hours putting nuts and bolts together for this cheap stand that you buy at a big box store that costs one-fourth the amount and lasts one-fourth the amount of time and not even during that time is it as safe as a quality stand that you can buy. You can extend that to deer blinds too. They have a lot of cheaply made deer blinds that are gonna last you a few seasons and a well-built bit redneck blind that's manufactured in Lamar, Missouri, made out of fiberglass is meant to last for many decades and not break down, not wear down, quality components and that's what you get. You get what you pay for with quality stands and blinds that you find in most things. You get, get what you pay for. Optics. As a general rule, you spend at least as much on your optics as you do your gun. I'd rather see you buy a $300 single shot H&R rifle. Make some good slug guns, some little rifles. My dad's rifle. It's a 25 out 6 only rifle he ever owned. And then you put a $500 Vortex scope on it. Put a nice scope on it. The optics are what rule the roost in late shooting, in low light situations, in longer distance shooting. Quality optics are meant to last a lifetime along with the guns they're put on. But I can remember Pennsylvania Deer Camp, and I've said this a few times, the guys are buying these beautiful Weatherby rifles. They're spending a grand on the rifle with fancy engraving, really nice barrels. And then they're putting an $80 scope on that after a long rainy day in the Pennsylvania public land deer woods, they're literally taking their scopes off their gun, they're putting it in the oven and baking out the moisture on the inside of the scope. I am not kidding. 
that's how cheap those scopes were. I think they would have been far better off buying a $500 rifle, putting a $500 scope on it, $600, $800 scope, and enjoy the use of that rifle and that scope for a lifetime without having to take the scope off and put it in the oven. These are things, if you notice, the best hunting investments, they last a lifetime, they last decades, they last for a very long time. Footwear. I love my lacrosse boots. They're very warm, I have the 1600 gram. I had the old military surplus Mickey Mouse boots in the past that I have still. I haven't worn them for a couple years, but I bought those when I was my late teens, early 20s. I remember my dad helping me buy them. We went to Joe's Army Navy surplus in Pontiac. That's a long time ago, it seems. Uh, good times, going in with my brother and my dad. And uh, I think my brother might have bought some uh, Woolrich hunting pants at that time or something. But, um, you know, again, they last for decades. I still have them. And, uh, you know, quality footwear, keeping yourself warm, keeping yourself dry. Um, you know, of course, you don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on this stuff. But a quality pair of boots for $150, $200 are going to last you many, many years if you take care of them and you're careful with them. And they're not only going to last those years, again, they're going to be comfortable just like the clothing. You know, bows and guns, we can talk about those. And people say, man, I don't want to spend $1,200 on a new bow or the top of the line bow. And what I would say is wait a couple years. You're not going to find that much of a difference in technology. But a bow that's two years old, you're going to pay a half as much for 40% value, whatever it might be. You might even get some gadgets on it for that price. And it's going to be a lot better than the 14-year-old bow that you have or 12-year-old bow. And, of course, guns. When you make an investment on a quality gun, it's going to last a lifetime. And when you're thinking about a gun that you're going to buy, you think, okay, I'm 40 years old. I wish I was 40 still, but I'm 50. But um, let's say you're 40 years old and you say, okay, I might use this gun for 35, 40 years. Think about if you're spending $200 or $300 more for a gun with quality features, maybe an upgrade in manufacture, whatever it might be, and you're spreading that out over 35 years. I mean, really, we could be talking $10 a year more for a passion that you love and is a way of life, you know, hunting that we, that we all enjoy and why you're watching this to begin with. Number five, skill. Investing in skill, putting time into scouting, looking at aerial photos, trying to find people that are actually successful in the hunting industry and following them, see what kind of advice they have, trying to weed out. That's what I did even just shooting uh, archery skill back in the 90s, really finding the people. I didn't go to the person at Gander Mountain that was giving advice. I went to the person that was winning state shoots and state tournaments, 3D tournaments, even when I was on the national 3D circuit. I'd talk to people that had actually proven success. Um, during that time and ask them what they're doing different or just watch them, see what they're doing different, watch their practice routines. And the same thing can be said for hunting. Your investment in hunting skill as opposed to buying gear and gadgets and things that you're trying to use to replace that skill, you can never replace that skill. And I'll tell you what, I've been hunting for, this is my 35th, 36th season, somewhere around there, and I learn things every single year. And that's the investment that I try to bring back to this channel. And here are my top five wasters. Some of you are, if you haven't already shut this off, you know, to this point, maybe you're going to shut it off now when you see some of these. These are some things that I think that you can't overcome hunting skill, highly quality stands, blinds, gear that you need that lasts a lifetime. If it lasts a long time, it's probably a quality investment. A lot of things that are poor investments don't last or you have to get every single year. And, uh, and, and typically those short-term fixes are no solution at all when it comes to replacing the things that actually are good investments. Number one, deer scent lures. I had someone say, well, you know, they use a certain brand of deer urine and uh, a buck came into it and they shot it. And, you know, that's a, that was a great investment for that moment, even if you don't use it all the time. And what I say is if you're hunting with a high level of skill, you don't need the deer lure. You don't need the deer scent. You're hunting in a way that you're capitalizing on mature buck movements. You know where they're moving. You've scouted a public or private land. Private land, you've worked to set that up and you've done it the right way and the correct way, uh, public land, you've worked your tail off to scout, find these movements, and then you go in and hunt. A lot of times you put out scent that can actually ruin that set. A lot of these are just 
fancy replacements or attempts at replacement for a lack of hunting skill and a lack of hunting ability. You know what's interesting with a lot of these, I see the more people with gear, gadgets, whatever it might be that they're wasting their money on, are typically not the hunters that are successful on a consistent basis. And people are going to say, no, my, my cousin Rick, he shoots these giant bucks every year and he does this, and that's great. You know what's that? even mentioned like, you know, smoking and things like that. I never do, because I look at like, it doesn't matter if you're smoking cigarettes or cigar or whatever you're smoking on your deer stand. If your stand's located correctly, if you've applied a lot of hunting skill, then what's downwind of you and how much you stink doesn't matter. I find that I'm really careful about how much scent I leave going in and out of the woods and the scent trail I leave, but when I'm on stand, I really don't worry about my scent too much. We're a sweaty mess by the time we walk 40 minutes uphill, every step uphill almost to get into a deer stand in the morning. We sweat. I've taken, I get up to my, the top sometimes and I take my hand and I run it through my hair and you can hear the sweat hit the leaves down on the ground below 20 feet below. Get that worked up. You can manage your sweat. You can manage your stink when you're on the stand. But you're not going to do it by trying to cover it up with a scent contraption machine in the deer stand. That's not going to replace the lack of hunting skill and the lack of quality decisions that you can make in the woods. Deer scent lures, you're not typically going to use that. I always talk about the story again of me wasting my money when I was a teenager on a $14 bottle of scent and I used it the whole, you know, it shows you know how foolish I was at that time, but I used it the whole sit in one night and I was so guilty after using that because I didn't have a lot of money to spend on stuff like that. Scent contraption machine, same thing. If you're trying to cover up your scent, thinking that that's going to cover up the lack of skill to actually find a stand and locate your stand appropriately so the deer are not downwind. And if you say, well, the deer, you can't determine they're not going to be downwind of you. And I'll say that's true, but that should be the 2% of the time, 5% of the time, because you've applied enough hunting skill to locate your stand in a good location where you don't expect deer downwind. You're using downwind blockers. You're using a, a sharp drop-off. You're using a lake. You're using open hardwoods. And someone will say, well, I hunt in open hardwoods. That's what I hunt in. I'd say, I'm not hunting in open hardwoods. I hunt on the edge of hardwoods. I hunt on the edge of habitat, the edge of drop-offs, the edge of a swamp. Deer are creatures of edge. So if you're just hunting in the open hardwoods, there's no edge there. If you just don't know if deer are going to come in downwind of you, find an edge, locate your stand appropriately. You don't need a lure then because you're traveling in a predetermined location. You don't need a scent contraption machine to cover up your scent. It's just another thing to waste your money on. Fancy arrow setups. All the rage right now. Let's get the heaviest arrow, heaviest blade. Let's drop it down to 210 feet a second. Who cares if we're off by three yards at 30 yards when we hit them in the brisket or put an arrow into its back or over its back because the trajectory is so poor. But I see a lot of people with these fancy arrow setups up there. Not everybody. I'm, I'm not knocking everybody in this, but I see a lot of people with those fancy arrow setups. They spend so much time in these fancy arrow sets. They're not good shots and they're not good hunters. They don't shoot a lot of deer. And it's just, just what it is. You see a lot of people that are most consistent hunters in the, in the hunting industry. Not all, but they're worried more about their accuracy and hunting skill than actually spending all this time on online forbs and debating your arrow setup, debating your bow setup, whatever it is. Just grab a bow. A good hunter is going to grab a bow, get the arrows that are appropriately matched to the bow, and they're going to go out and hunt and kill stuff. They're going to do it because they have hunting skill and because they've honed their accuracy and they've worried less about their specific arrow setup. And I'd rather see someone spend more time. Not that they're bad. I mean, use them. Use whatever you want. I don't really care. Just be accurate, no limitations of anything you use. And, um, but spend your time directed, directed in the right location. Number four, moon forecasts. Bottom line, let's put it this way. You could have a great moon day. Let's say there was a great moon day uh, compared to every other day in a 30-day period. I'll tell you what, if it's in central Indiana, if it's in central Ohio, central Missouri, it's November 6th. It's a 78 degree day with 30 mile an hour southwest winds. It's going to be a bad day to hunt. It doesn't matter if the moon's the perfect day of the year or not. Weather is always going to outrule moon. And moon might be 2% of the puzzle. And a lot of times it has to do with whether you need to bring a flashlight into the woods or if you're going to expect late movement because there's a full moon rise in the evening before. That's really the only thing that I consider. It might have some good late morning action or movement near a bedding area, near a small food source, not a giant food plot. But those bucks might get up or deer on their feet that late morning just because they fed high in the hog all night with a full moon. It was safe and secure and social. And then they're tired at daybreak. They're already in their beds. And that's something you consider. But to say November 7th is going to be a beautiful day and you're looking at 
with your boss trying to schedule off your time off seven months in advance because that's going to be the perfect moon day because this chart or whatever says that you should be hunting that day, then you're going to be guided towards success only if you're lucky. Instead, pay attention to the weather. Use my weather algorithm that's infused in HuntCast on the HuntWise app. And uh, that's actually something that works. You know, I mean, just look at it in terms of extremes. If a blizzard moves through your area, winds are 60 miles an hour and you're getting 18 inches of snow, deer aren't going to move. They're socked in, obviously. So the weather is suppressing them to the point where they just don't move. They stay in their beds, they conserve energy, and they hide. On the flip side, if it's 90 degrees in southern Michigan, and it's November 7th, and it's 30 mile an hour winds, deer aren't going to move. If it's a heavy thunderstorm and lightning, deer aren't going to move. Think of all the weather that suppresses movement, stops movement, and stops deer in the tracks. The moon doesn't do that. You don't look at it and say, oh, it's a three quarter moon today, it's a red moon, it's a full moon, and deer are moving high in the hog, or they're just stopped completely. The moon doesn't have that power, weather, does. If you figure out the weather, you can find consistent success. Moon forecasts are a huge waste of time and uh, not to mention waste of money if you actually have to pay for it, which is even worse. Number five, bad food plot blends, bad food plot seeds. Um, we've talked about that. I have some, you know, five food plot, bad food plot blends, but if you're seeing things like rye grass in a mix, run like the wind. If you're seeing things like sugar beets within a small percentage in a brassica plot, think that Sugar beets need more months to actually mature. Deer are going to pick them out. It's no good. If you're looking at a mix with a small percentage of forage peas, a pea planting is 300 pounds. A single source pea planting is 300 pounds per acre. So if you're looking at your favorite seed plant and it has five pounds in there just to say Austrian winter peas on a mix, then it's going to amount to one plant every 30 feet. It's not doing anything. It's just a buzzword to capture, like sugar beets, Austrian winter peas, just to capture your hunting dollars and to waste your dollars and to probably place a premium on that food plot seed, let alone rye grass that grows anywhere. Makes you think, oh, my food plot's green, but the deer don't eat it, they don't touch it, except in certain circumstances where they're really lacking in forage. And so those are some, some mixes that you can see, some blends that are just created to suck your money. And all of these things right here, they don't last. This lasts. All of this right here, a lot of these are, are setups and they give you a focus. You know, people like arrow setups and, and that's a hobby there. That's fine. I'm not saying anything bad about that. But there's a lot of things you should be focusing your time on. And I'll even relate it to my business. And I consult, you know, I was at 124 clients from mid December to mid September last year in 2019. I'm hoping to shrink that to about 80 to 90. That's what we're scheduling this year uh, for the 10 month period. A lot of people hire me because they want to plant the best food plot, create the best bedding area, the best water hole, the best mock scrape system. All of that cannot overcome the lack of hunting skill, the lack of using quality clothing, tree stands that'll be quiet, that allow you to get in the stand, a great pr approach, a great access. How you hunt in that skill level right here, number five, that'll ultimately determine your success in the deer woods way more than anything else. You know, someone could use a cheap gun with a you know, fairly cheap scope on it, same with a bow, stick bow. And if they're using a high degree of hunting skill, they're gonna be successful every year. None of this, whether it's great habitat improvements, certain food plot blends, scent contraption machines, deer lures, they can't overcome the lowest hole in the bucket, which is hunting school, skill. That's the best investment that you could ever apply, put into your hunt. If you're always doing the same thing, you're not developing hunting skill. If you're always thinking outside of the box, you're seeking information, then you can learn for your entire life right now. It doesn't matter if you're 15 years old right now and you're starting or an eight-year-old hunter that's watching this. I get a lot of kids that watch the YouTube channel. And that means a lot to me. You know, people that say this, this is helping me. I get a lot of hunters that have been watching the channel and uh, they say, you know what? And I did things the same for a long time. It spoiled me on hunting. I didn't want to hunt anymore. I haven't really hunted the last seven years. But 
the tips and tactics on this channel have gotten me back into hunting. I'm excited to hunt and I found success, more success this year. And, uh, and that's just a testament that you can never, ever stop learning. I don't stop learning. And when I learn something, I try to bring it to you on the channel and offer good advice and good information that can be an investment that you can use for the rest of your life. Focus on lifetime investments, quality investments as it comes to hunting, and you're gonna find consistent success in the deer woods and be very wary of the time wasters and the money wasters that are out there in the hunting industry that are just trying to grab your dollars and they're ultimately not going to help you become a better hunter this fall or for the rest of your life. Continue to learn, make an investment in your hunting skill. And you're not only gonna be a more successful hunter, but you're gonna be a hunter that's retained in the hunting rakes for the rest of your life. And you're probably gonna recruit other hunters. It's great for the hunting industry. Learn, apply, tell others about it. And that's the focus of this channel. And I hope the focus with you every single season, never stop learning. And I think you'll have a great hunt for the rest of your life. Now, as we transition into habitat season, I hope you've had a chance to check out my web class, how to design your web, your whitetail parcel. It's on my website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description and I hope you can find it, check it out and enjoy it this year.